Our scripture reading for this morning is taken from John chapter 1, verses 43 through 51. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Thus says the Lord. Thank you, Jackie and Chipta. We have an Instagram account? I'm joking. I know we do. We're so cool. Um, well, thank you. Yeah, a lot of information uh, that we have is on there. So please check it out uh, just to get to know our next community group or Bible study. Or We have all these different programs coming up, so it's going to be hard to keep track of them or remember them just Sunday morning. So the account is a really good way to do that. Also, one more announcement. We're going to have uh, a monthly prayer meeting uh, that uh, two of our members are initiating. And uh, would love for you guys to join that uh, if, if you want to. Uh, just time to pray for the city, for each other. Uh, and for the church as well. Not only this one, but other churches in the city as well. So if you do want to join the monthly prayer, I, I think the first one um, is going to happen this this Saturday. And go to Jackie or Andrew in the back, or Jackie here, uh, if you want to join to get to know details, just where it's at and the time and the location and stuff like that. Okay, so I encourage you to do that. Okay, all right, guys, today uh, we're going to continue in our sermon through the Gospel of John. That's our series that we're going through right now. Uh, John, as we've talked about, is a book in the Bible that records the life and the ministry of Jesus on earth. And there's, there's four books in the Bible like this that records the life and ministry of Jesus. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These are called the Gospels. They're the first four books of the New Testament. We've seen a lot of things so far in the book of John, such as who Jesus is, uh, who is God that became man, and, and and dwelled as flesh to pursue sinners like us, to give his life as a ransom, as a, as a payment for our sins, those who he claims as his own. And the story moves along through the Gospel of John. Um, and we'll also see it in, in this narrative today that there are people now that follow this Jesus. We've seen John the Baptist do so a past few, uh, the past few weeks. Um, and also last week, we saw three other of Jesus' first disciples, Andrew, Peter and John, the author, John, the guy who wrote the book of John himself, following Jesus. Should this not be our natural response? If we claim to believe Jesus is who he claims to be, should not following him and proclaiming him to the world be our natural response, as those people mentioned here? In our passage today, verses 43 to 51, we continue in the story, we see even further encouragement. For us today, of why Christians, those who claim Jesus as Lord and Savior, should continue to follow him and continue to proclaim his name to the world, to the city we're in, to others, even if doing so might come at our own expense and might be costly to us. We mainly see this in our passage today with how Jesus interacts with one of his other followers called Nathaniel. We'll, we'll talk more about that later. So as we go through the narrative progression of our passage today, I want to point out three things. One how Jesus confronts earthly paradigms, two, how Jesus reveals God's paradigm, three, how Jesus transforms our paradigms, how Jesus confronts earthly paradigms, how Jesus reveals God's paradigm, and how Jesus transforms our paradigms. Let me pray for us, and then we'll get into it. Father, we thank you uh, for your word. We thank you that you have communicated to us in language in a way that we understand through your written word, through your scripture, the word of God. And Lord, as we explore it and study it, I pray that you be kind and gracious to our minds and also to our hearts, that we may um, know and understand, but also experience fully of your gospel and of your word, that we may follow you 
and as you have led us to be in this, in this world. Father, we thank you again for who you are and for your son. Um, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's get to it. Point number one, how Jesus confronts earthly paradigms. If you guys heard this word before, I know it's a kind of a weird word, but a paradigm is just another way of saying a framework or, or a, it's a perspective. It's a way of thinking, right? A paradigm is a set of agreed definitions of, of things. These definitions collected together becomes a paradigm. Or in other words, it's a way of thought. It's, it's a belief system. Every culture has it. For example, how a particular culture or a person defines things like greatness or worthlessness or success or failure or beauty or ugliness or significance or insignificance, all these definitions that a culture has or that we have, put them all together in one big pot, mix it up, and that's a paradigm becomes a worldview, way, a way of thinking. And we all here have paradigms. We all have our own definitions of, say, what it means to be great, what it means to be successful, what it means to be beautiful, what it means to be significant. We have that. And it's important for us here to understand a huge part of the Lord's work in our lives, in our growth in Him, is redefining some of these assumed paradigms that we have and reveal to us that some of these paradigms we have may not be correct, may not be the correct definition of them. That's exactly what John does in our passage today. He questions our paradigms. He forces us to ask whether or not my definition of greatness, my definition of beauty, my definition of success and significance it is actually the definition of those things. Or maybe has it been influenced by the world more than it has been influenced by the word of God? And throughout the scripture, it's clear. There's a difference between God's definition of these things, like beauty, significance, greatness, and the world's definition of these things. Let's look at a few verses before we get into our passage. Matthew chapter 20, verse 16 says, it's really confusing. So the last will be first and the first last. What? There, there, there's no way we can under, that won't make any sense unless we understand that there are two paradigms in play. What it's saying is those who follow Christ, though it may result in the world seeing us as last, we aren't actually last. That's, that's how the world sees it. But in God's paradigm, we're actually first, although the world might count us as last. Mark, Mark 10, 42-45. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. Christians, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and give his life as a ransom for many. The world views greatness and significance and leadership as having the power to lord over other people, as having the power to control and overpower other people. And God saying, that is not greatness, that is not leadership. Humility and service, and servanthood, and lowering yourself, that's leadership, that's greatness, that's significance. See, again, there's two paradigms in play, different definitions of them. So let, let's go back to our text. Where do we see all of this in our passage today? Let's begin with verses 43 and 44. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip here is the fourth disciple mentioned in the book. And it's interesting to see, if you read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and also the book of Acts, every time Philip is mentioned in the list of disciples, it would say, and the disciples of Jesus are da 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 and list out the names. Philip is always mentioned fifth. Every single time. He's always fifth place. He's always mentioned after Peter, John, James, and Andrew. Even in our book, in the book of John today, Philip was only introduced in verse 43, after Peter, John, and Andrew was first introduced in verses 35 to 42. He's always mentioned later. And immediately, John the author here kind of pokes at our worldly assumptions. See, mo mo most of the readers probably felt, ah, poor Philip, always fifth place. He's never first, second, third, fourth. But at this point, we must ask ourselves, 
Does being first or fifth really matter all that much in the list of disciples? I don't know about you, but, but, but me, if I'm completely honest, it feels like if I'm always mentioned fifth, like not just once or twice, but every single time a group of people are named, I'm always fifth, it'll make me feel a little bit insignificant. It'll make me feel like, why do they get to go first before me, right? And it's the same names, Peter, Andrew, John. <laughs> what, what do they have that makes them more significant than me? What makes me lesser than them? See, even from the get-go, John the author is poking at the reader's pre-assumed worldly paradigm because we tend to think that, don't we? If, if, if Philip was always mentioned in fifth place, that must mean he's less valuable or less significant than the other four. So, so let's continue in our, in our paradigm. Philip was called by Jesus to follow him. He, he follows him. And what does Philip do? Verse 45 to 46, Philip found another follower, Nathaniel. And said to him, We have found him, of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Now here we see the one struggling with the worldly paradigms of significance and power and, and all that is not only us here, but who? Nathanael. He struggles as well. L look at his response to Philip's invitation to follow Jesus. You can see in Nathaniel's worldly paradigm painted all over it. First, let's take a closer look at what Philip said, verse 45. We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Moses in the law here is referring to the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah. Okay, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. That's, that's how they say, when they say Moses and the law, that's what they mean, the first five books. What Philip is saying, we, we found him. We found the guy that the Torah is talking about. He's, he's finally here. We don't have to wait any longer. The Redeemer, the Savior is here. But think about it. When was the name of Jesus ever written in the Torah, in the book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy? You read those books and you'll see the name Jesus mentioned zero times. So what does Philip mean that the one written in the Torah is here? Well, think about it. We've talked about this before, I think, but I think it's, it's good to repeat. What is the main theme and the main storyline in the first five books of the Old Testament? Of Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy. There, there's one character, a main character, Moses. Do you remember what circumstances Moses was born under? He was born under an evil king, an evil Egyptian king king who wanted to kill all the male babies at the time because he was scared that he was going to lose power, right? And then Moses' parents um, uh, hid him and he was saved because of that, right? And what, was, what did Moses do? He freed God's people out of the slavery of Egypt into the promised land of Canaan. This is he, Jesus. This is who the Torah talks about. This person, Jesus, what circumstances was he born under? He was born under an evil ruler, not Pharaoh, but Herod, right? Who wanted to kill all male babies. Why? Because he was scared that he was going to lose power. And what did Jesus do? He freed God's people, not out of the slavery of Egypt, but out of the slavery of our own sin. Unto where? Into the promised land, not Canaan, but the new heavens and the new earth. He's here, our true Moses, the one Moses is all about, the one Moses points to, the the point of the Torah, he's here, the one who will truly save us, he's here, Jesus. But not only is he the fulfillment of the Torah, he's also what the prophets wrote about all throughout the Old Testament. Let's just take one big prophet, Isaiah. Okay, Isaiah 54, verses 4 to 5. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Who is this about? <laughs> this is about Jesus. And Philip is saying, do you not, he's here. The person the Torah is talking about, the person the prophets is talking about, he's finally here, our savior, the Messiah, he's here. And Nathaniel at this point, I imagine, probably thought something like this. Wow, that's pretty awesome. That sounds really great. I wonder what awesome town this Messiah came from. I wonder what influential family he was born under. And Philip continues in verse 45. He is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Nazareth? 
Really? That's where the Messiah chose to come to? Nazareth was a very small, insignificant, below average province at the time. There's 2,000 people in it at least. And it's actually a town much smaller than where um, Nathaniel came from, which we later learn in, I think, chapter 21, Nathaniel's from Cana. And it's a, it's, or it's a, it's a bigger, more significant um, um, province. Nazareth and Joseph, son of Joseph? Who, who is this Joseph guy? I, I haven't really heard him much. He's not really rich. He doesn't really have much influence in our, in our community. Are you sure? Are you sure the king of kings, the fulfillment of the Torah, the fulfillment of the prophets, the guy who's the whole point of creation, of glory, of power, of significance, of success, this, this guy came through Nazareth? Under Joseph, such weak, insignificant origins. You're telling me God, Yahweh, came to us through a place like Nazareth, under a family like that. Why would God choose such weak, insignificant origins? That's not strength. That's not greatness. That's what Nathaniel thought. See, here we find Nathaniel imposing upon God the world's paradigms of greatness and significance. Nathaniel's definition of success and strength, and perhaps ours as well, is influenced more by the world rather than the Word of God. And it's, it's actually so ingrained in us. Like, it's so ingrained in us that I don't even have to take time explaining what that looks like. When I say the world's definition of greatness and power and success, we all have a picture that comes to mind. And it's, it's probably something like this, you know, rich, powerful, charismatic, comes from an influential family, probably has 4% body fat and ideal weight, <laughs> right? That, 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 that's like what we, that's what we picture when we think of greatness and success and significance. You, we all think that. I don't have to explain it anymore. I mean, it's not bad to do that. If you do have 4% body fat, please tell me how you did it. I'll stick to your diet for like two weeks maybe and then not anymore. But I'm not saying those things are bad, but what's dangerous is that's just, that's our definition of, of beauty. That's our definition of greatness. That's our definition of significance. Where did that come from? Is that the definition of significance, of beauty? That's what Nathaniel thought. Why should Nathaniel follow this man from, from Nazareth, son of Joseph? Why, why should I, we might think, why should I embrace Jesus? Look at him. He's weak, financially below average. He was killed on a cross. I'm not following him, Nathaniel says. A man who structures his life upon the world's paradigm. Maybe like some of us today, I know for sure, me. But how about us? Do, do we not follow the world's paradigm every time we decide to disobey Jesus? Every time we decide to say no to him when it's costly to us? Is, not, is that not what we're saying? Perhaps we choose um, to, not, uh, to not obey him and, and, and it's hard for us to obey him when we're called to decline profitability at work by choosing integrity. I'd rather choose success than integrity. Or sacrifice our reputation by sharing about his gospel, his, for, his forgiveness on the cross to others. That, that's embarrassing. I don't want to do all that. I don't want to give up my social significance. Right? Now, at this point, you guys probably expect me to say something like this. Come on, guys, deny yourself. Carry your cross. Die to yourself. Be willing to be insignificant if it glorifies God. Be willing to be weak. Don't worry about success. Deny yourself and follow him. Now, of course, that's, that's one way to approach it. And it's very biblical, and it's very right to tell people to do that. In fact, there are many passages in the Bible that would demand me to preach in that way. But our passage today takes a bit of a different approach. Not better, not worse, just different. What if, what if instead of biting the bullet and mustering up the strength to be weak for the sake of Christ and others, what if instead we change our definition of strength? What if instead of convincing ourselves to toughen up and share the gospel, even when it puts our social significance at risk, what if instead we redefine the definition of significance? What if instead of convincing us that we must have integrity, even if it causes us to, 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 have, uh, to, to, to lose financial success? What if instead of that, we redefine our definition of success altogether? That, that's what our passage is doing here. What if we truly believe 
that greatness, success, strength, significance, beauty, doesn't look like the rich, powerful, come from an influential family, 4% body fat, ideal weight person. That, that's usually pop, that pops in our mind when we think about it. But what if it looked like something completely different than that? What is God's definition of that? What is God's paradigm? All right, this is where we've gone to point number two. How Jesus reveals God's paradigm. In verse 46, as a response to Nathaniel's demeaning answer about Jesus, Philip says, okay, come and see. So Nathaniel goes and sees Jesus for himself. Verse 47 uh, to 49. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus prophesied, and immediately Nathanael was impressed. Look at his response. Rabbi, you must be the Son of God. You must be the King of Israel. Of course he'd be impressed. Because according to Nathaniel's worldly paradigm, someone who can do something as great as prophesy must be powerful. Someone who can do such a thing must be significant. And Jesus rebukes him later in verse 50 saying, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, because I've shown off a little bit my ability to prophesy, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. He's saying, Nathaniel, you're still missing the point. You're still having the wrong paradigm. You're still defining strength the way the world defines it. Uh, you can see it. You can see Nathaniel responding to him that way. Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Nathaniel gives three addresses to Jesus. Rabbi, son of God, king of Israel. First one, rabbi. That means teacher. Okay, that's fine. Uh, uh, you prophesied. You must be some kind of rabbi or, or, or teacher. That's fine. Son of God. That's clearly a lot of messianic Old Testament allusions to that term, son of God. He prophesied, so he must be the son of God. He must be the one that will redeem his people. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But the last address, king of Israel. That's when we get into a bit of a problem. See, by calling people the king of Israel, Nathanael was still looking at Jesus through the worldly paradigm. The title of king of Israel addressed only twice in the Old Testament in reference to God. Zephaniah 3.15 and Isaiah 44.6. We don't have to get into it. But both times when God is addressed as the king of Israel, it's always under the context of God protecting his people from external threats, from outside threats, other nations. Um, um, and there's also other literature that's not in the Bible, uh, other, lit other books at the time, every time they use the term king of Israel in reference to God, it's always in a military power kind of way to protect them from like, other nations and, and outside, outside influences. And a commentary of our passage even says, what Nathaniel almost certainly saw by saying king of Israel was a political and militaristic king. He still had the wrong paradigm. He was still thinking that, that Jesus will redeem his people through military might, through political prowess. That's strength, that's significance, that's greatness. I mean, how else would Jesus redeem his people? Right? See, by, by calling him that, he's still working through the world's paradigm. And Jesus said, because I said to you, I saw you under a fig tree, do you believe? Nathaniel, you're still thinking of the world's paradigms. That is not how I define greatness. That is not how I define success. That is not the definition of significance and power. You will see greater things than these. There's, there's something else that you'll see. There's something else that defines true greatness and significance and power. What is it then? Jesus, God. What is the definition of greatness and, and power and significance? Tell me how you define these things. Jesus answers surprisingly in verse 51. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Stick with me a little bit longer. We're going to go back to the Old Testament one more time. Okay? What does that mean? Okay. To understand what Jesus is talking about, we have to know where in the Old Testament he's referring to. It's Genesis 28, 12. It's referring to Jacob. Jacob had a dream, and the dream was recorded in the book of Genesis, and this is the dream. And he, Jacob, dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. The dream Jacob had was, was that there one day will be a way to God. 
There will be hope of a redemption of sinful men like us. Jesus is making a huge claim here. He's saying, I'm that hope. I'm the Redeemer. I'm the only way, truth, and life. No one gets the Father but through me. But how does he do that? How does he become our hope, our Redeemer? Well, how will God accomplish this great, most significant, most beautiful, most powerful act in history? Surely it's going to be some kind of display of power and greatness, right? Sparkles everywhere. Surely it's going to be an overpowering of such. Well, that's how the world would see it. But how does God, the most powerful being in the universe, redeem his people? Is it by military might? It's by hanging on a cross. A cross? Nazareth? Son of Joseph? These aren't things of strength. These things aren't significant. This isn't greatness. This is weakness. This is despicable. This is ugliness. This is insignificant. Or is it? Whose paradigm are you going by? God, you're telling me that this is the definition of strength? Look at you. You're hanging on a weak cross. You call this significance? Look at the Roman soldiers making fun of you. You call this success? You have nothing left. The little that you have left is being divided by the Romans under your cross as they make fun and spit at you. You call this greatness? He does. He does. Because in God's paradigm, true greatness true success, true significance and strength is not found in how high you can go, but in how low you're willing to get for the sake of others. In God's paradigm, greatness, success, significance and strength is not found in how high you can go, but in how low you're willing to get for the sake of others. Now, some Christians I know have heard something like this before, and they responded very frustratedly. Why? Because often when they hear something like this, they equate it with recklessness or self-depreciation. They, they responded to something like this. So what are you saying? I, I have to like make all my friends hate me because I'm sharing the gospel all the time? Or, or you want me to give all my money to the Lord? Are you saying you want me to have no friends and you want my family to starve? Okay, calm down. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying be reckless. And 1 Timothy 5 says, if you can't provide for your family, you're worse than a non-believer. So no, that's not, that's not what we're saying. But often also becomes frustrating because it sounds like we're encouraging you to feel worthless. We're encouraging you to self-depreciate your value and just don't care about your needs and just, and just give to other people. That, that's not what God is talking about here. We're not saying you should give out of a sense of worthlessness because you don't deserve anything and because you're just a piece of trash, then you just have to give everything away. That's not true giving. That's not true prioritizing of others. That, that's that's self-centered. That, that's not what we're saying either. All we're saying is redefine your paradigm. Come and see that when you start to believe God's definition of success and greatness and significance, it'll encourage you to follow him more deeply and more joyfully because you'll start to realize that God's command of giving up stuff for him and for others is actually not a call to sacrifice at all. It's a call to gain more. You see? Philippians 3, 7 to 8, Paul said, Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. There's a true story of a missionary couple um, I don't know the details of, of where they went, but, but a husband and a wife who went to a really hard place uh, uh, to share the gospel. And to, I think, I don't know if they planted a church or they were just doing missions there. Um, but in order to um, do that, they had to give up a lot of stuff that the world would define as success and greatness and, and richness. And, and, and the world says you need these things to be significant and great. And they lost a lot of it, uh, more than your normal um, uh, Christian would. Um, and when hearing about this, their mission sending agency, the ones who sent them, uh, visited them just to encourage them and to tell them that um, uh, uh, they're, they're appreciated and they're, and they're valuable and they, they're loved and prayed for. Um, and in that, in that attempt, uh, the guy came in and, and told to the people, I just, ah, man, this, they want, he wanted to empathize. It was a good heart. He said, I, I just can't imagine all that you've given up for the Lord. 
man, it's amazing. And to that, they responded, we really haven't given up anything at all. We've, we've gained. Now, a skeptical mind like mine is quick to say, come on, man, let's put off the super spiritual act. You lost a lot, all right? You're among friends now. You don't have to put on this persona of my loss is gain for Christ. Just chill out, be yourself, and just admit that you've lost a lot. You might think that too. But we don't know that, do we? I must not be so quick to disqualify their words. Could they be faking it to look super spiritual? Maybe. Could they be so self-righteous that they don't feel their own losses? Maybe. Could they be so emotionally numb that they don't know how to feel? Perhaps. But perhaps, just perhaps, they actually have such a godly paradigm about success and gain and significance and strength. And even though the world views their lives as going downward into a spiral of insignificance of being last, they saw and felt something completely different. They saw and felt the opposite. What makes one great isn't their ability to prophesy. Jesus is trying to tell Nathaniel. What makes someone great is their willingness to go however low it takes to glorify God and for the sake of others. Get higher, the world says. Gain, gain, gain. When you've earned for yourself at whatever cost, that's when you're at your greatest. Climb higher, be great. The cross says, no, no, no. Get lower. Give. Give, give, be so transfixed with his glory and on others at whatever cost. And if it requires you to lose some earthly success and praises, then get low. Be great. Don't be mindless about it to where you're reckless, and don't do it out of a sense of insecurity, that self-depreciation. But just one step forward, one step at a time, start to change your paradigm about greatness and success and significance and beauty to God's definition instead of the world. And watch, watch the level and depth and joy of your obedience steadily grow. At this point of the sermon, we may think, I don't know, man. I mean, I get it. I see, I see God's definition of, of greatness and success and beauty, and I see how that's the right one and the world's definition is not the right one. But I just honestly don't see how I'm going to get there from here. I don't see how I'm ever going to be that kind of person who views life in that way. Well, let's end here on our third point, how Jesus transforms our paradigms. I want us to look at a key phrase in this, in this whole passage. In verse 39, and uh, we studied it, oh, no, in verse 46, uh, uh, this word, come and see. It's the same word that we studied last week in verse 39. Uh, 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 Philip says and repeats it again, come and see, follow Jesus. I want to point out two things about this phrase, come and see. Come and see, there's a, there, there's, a, there's a call to do and there's a call to see, okay? Let's first talk about a call to do. How do I get to there from here? How can my paradigm of the world and of life change and let not the world define it, but rather God? Well, come and see, Philip implies, as mentioned last week, come and see is, is the command to do, right? Come and see, actually pick up your feet, actually do things, obey, act, move forward, follow me. This is how you get from here to there. This is how you start transforming your paradigm that's been influenced by the world to God's. I mean, how, how do we grow in other areas of life? To get better in our craft or in our job or at school? What do we do? We, we practice, we practice, we do it over and over and over again and we study. And I think this is where we have an unhealthy divide of spirituality and, and physicality. As if there's like two separate things. Um, it's like when it comes to physical stuff, we have to do and train ourselves and practice and get better and get better and get better. But when it comes to spiritual things, uh, uh, spiritual things, it's as if there's this, there's a, some sort of automatic secret spiritual epiphany button to push. And if we push it, poof, we're there. <laughs> as if there's like this one magic sermon that if you listen to, you're, you're going to be, given, or there's one magic Tim Keller book that's hidden from everyone else. And if you read it, it's like you, poof, you're there. It's, it's not, if that's not how it works in the world, why is that work? Why is that the way it works in spirituality? No, there's no such thing. Train yourselves. 
Work hard. Get there. Make one decision at a time. It takes time. Paul himself, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, equates the Christian walk as a runner that runs diligently and as an athlete that trains his body. Come and see. Go and do it. When the opportunity presents itself, which paradigm will you live by? Will, will you share the gospel, though it might put your image at jeopardy? Will you choose integrity, though it might put earthly success at risk? Will you admit you're wrong, though it might make you seem weak, or as the world defines weakness? Come and see. Choose his paradigm and find yourself growing in him. And you don't, might not see how these small results will amount to much, but if you keep making these small decisions over and over and over, imagine what your life will be 50, 60 years from now. Imagine what this church will be if it's filled with people who continues to train themselves and make these decisions 50, 60 years from now. But second, it's not only a call to come and, and do, it's also a call to see. See what? Something very interesting. Let's go back to our passage one last time. John, the author, plays a, uh, does a bit of a play on words here, specific, specifically in the first two words of verse 47. So the context here is Philip, uh, Philip shared with Nathaniel, and Nathaniel said, Nazareth, weak family, weak province, I'm not going to follow him. And Philip says, come and see. So Nathaniel comes wanting to what? Wanting to see Jesus. He wanted to put Jesus under a microscope. He wanted to see for himself and put him to the test. Nathaniel wanted to see Jesus. But what are the first two words in verse 47? Right after Nathaniel wanted to come and see Jesus. Jesus saw. Nathaniel came, wanted to put Jesus to the test. It's a bit of a plot twist here. He came to see Jesus, but it was Jesus that saw Nathaniel. Who was it that started revealing truth about who? Jesus was revealing truth about Nathaniel. Jesus was diagnosing Nathaniel. Nathaniel came to see, but yet it was Jesus who saw him. Nathaniel came to see Jesus thinking he was going to put Jesus under the microscope only to realize that Jesus has had him under the microscope the whole time. And what is it that we see about Nathaniel in the following verses? Well, based on Nathaniel's conversations with Jesus, we see that Nathaniel's worldly paradigms was so deeply rooted in him, he can't shake it off. Wow, we can prophesy, you must be the king of Israel who's going to overpower our enemies and beat them all with your strength. What we see, what Jesus saw, is Nathaniel's inability to shake off his worldly paradigms. Saying what? How does it apply to us? Come and see. Come and follow Jesus. Come and try to make those decisions of putting God's paradigm first. Do that. Go ahead. You know what you'll see? You'll see that it's going to be really hard to do so. You'll see that the world's paradigm is so deeply ingrained in you that most of the time, you're going to choose the world over Jesus. Come, do it. Try it out. Grow in it and see how hopeless you are. And see how unable you are to do that. That's what Jesus told Nathaniel. He tells us today, I see you. I know you. I've seen it all before. It's not a surprise to me. That's why I came down to open up heaven for you, verse 51 says. I will be the fulfillment of Jacob's dream of a ladder to heaven in Genesis 28 because you can't do it on your own. And please don't make this mistake. Oh my goodness. People make this mistake all the time and it changes the whole gospel. People define Jacob's ladder as God giving us a ladder so that we can climb up to God. No. The ladder isn't a significance of us climbing to God. It's signifying God climbing down to us. That's the gospel. We're not climbing to God. We can't do it on our own. It's so ingrained and we're addicted to it. He needs to come to us. We're hopelessly addicted to the world. God, who became flesh, verses 1 to 18 said, Jesus, the Lamb of God, who climbed down from heaven and climbed up on a cross. God, the Son, left heaven, so to speak, and came into the world to die for us, who would never leave the world for him. That's the gospel. I will climb low for you, he says, even unto a cross. Why would you do that, Jesus? Why would you subject yourself to such weakness? To such insignificance? Well, because true greatness, success, significance, and strength 
is not found in how high you can go, but in how low you're willing to get for the sake of others and the glory of God. That's why. Come, follow me, do it, grow in it. And we'll see growth as we continue to do that through God's grace, but through it all, we'll also see something else, something Jesus has seen all along, that more often than not, we will choose the world more often than not, we will live our lives according to the world's paradigms. We'll be entranced by the glamour and the glitter of this world. And to that he says, I'm not surprised. <laughs> I've seen and known that all along, and I love you still. I will climb down from heaven unto a cross for you still. You know what this does? When we continue to fight and follow him and continue to try and make decisions based on his paradigm, not the world's, and when we experience failure and apply the gospel to ourselves, but, but continue to walk again and follow him and make decisions again and fail again and apply the gospel again, you know what this does? It slowly will change the picture that comes to mind when we think of strength and power and significance and success. It won't look like this rich, powerful, influential person that that comes to mind. That'll slowly fade away. And you know whose image will start to replace that? Jesus' image on a cross. This is power. This is richness. The most powerful and richest influential being in the universe became weak, poor, and powerless for you. Let's redefine our definition of greatness. Let's redefine our definition of beauty, of significance, of power. Let's let God do it. That is beauty. This is strength. This is greatness. For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form of majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. True greatness success, significance, and strength is not found in how high you can go, but in how low you're willing to get for the sake of others and the glory of God. Let's pray. Father, what an example we are called to follow. What a picture of greatness. The most significant, powerful act ever in history. God climbed down from heaven unto a cross. He prioritized sinners like us who would rather choose the world, sinners who would never leave the world for you, who were so addicted to the world's definition of beauty, who were so addicted to the world's definition of strength and power and grandeur and glory and significance that we live our lives based on that and sometimes even into idolatry and addiction and unhealth. Father, yet you, the creator of all, lived by the true paradigms, the true definition of these things, and portrayed it, lived it out, when you climbed on that cross. Father, we cannot do this on our own. We need you. We need a Savior. We need a Redeemer. And that now, after we've received you, we're accounted as sinless, we're accounted as beautiful, as pure, as clean, through you, not through us, and as we live this life now as those in unity with you, in relationship with you, give us the strength and the power to live our lives based on your paradigm and create a culture of people who has a paradigm defined by you and not by what this city defines as beauty, not by what this city defines as greatness and significance. And Father, by your grace, as we fail and as we continue to walk and grow in it, we may also portray this to those who do not yet know you. And they look at us seeing there's something different. There's something out of this world about how they live. Thank you for your mercy and your cross. Thank you that you know and you've seen us all along that we can't do it on our own. Thank you for, your, for the Father's love so deeply for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.